Open up your Bibles. We're going to be in Romans 12, and we're going to be in Hebrews 12 and 13 in different places about as we continue our uh, subject this morning. Uh, by the way, those of you that are members here, you know what we've been talking about over the last several months. We've been talking about declutter, right? We want to bring some kind of sense and sensibility to our phonetically hectic uh, lives. And we started off in August talking about our closets and our garages, not only the ones that we have at our, at our house, but in our hearts and in our souls and in our minds. And then since then, we've been looking at various areas that really are of uh, importance to us as believers. In the month of October, we've been talking about worship, corporate worship, what we do when we all uh, come together, whenever that might be, usually on a Sunday morning. That's our biggest time, I guess you might say, that we come together. So we've been talking about corporate worship and what that means. Four weeks ago, we talked about the fact uh, that, that we can expect some things out of corporate worship, and we talked about what we can expect. We can expect, in a word, contact, right? Contact with an unseen, yet not unknown and not unfelt, God. And we can expect contact with each other, members, fellow members of the tribe. We're all on the same trail. The details are a little bit different here and there, but we're all basically on that, on that same trail. And contact with the Holy Spirit, God's gift to the church collective as an alternative to sin and alienation. And, and we can expect uh, renewal, contact with renewal. You can expect to leave in a different place that you, then, then when you came in, you can be renewed and you're going to be equipped and we're going to be better ready to deal with the world around us. And you can expect contact with the Word of God. Uh, you know, I, I think about public worship really as a kind of like an air hole right up to the attic of heaven. It bypasses a lot of stuff and I can find a, a breath of fresh air. Heaven, heaven kind of blowing through my life as we all come together collectively it's like a couple of whales and I told you about this back in the streams of praise five or six years ago on a Wednesday night and if you were here you might remember that Piku and Siku did anybody remember those whales Piku and Siku maybe from actual when it actually occurred uh, they were two whales that got trapped up in the Barrow Straits of Alaska there was an early winter and it kind of froze over uh, far enough long enough that they could not get out to the open sea without air Whales, of course, are mammals. They have lungs just like you and I do, and, and they've got to have air to survive, and it had frozen over so far that they couldn't actually make it out without drowning. Sounds strange, doesn't it? Think about it, a, a, a water animal drowning. And so the United States and, and Russia joined together. They banded up. They kind of uh, got their, all their equipment together, and they drilled air holes ever so many feet all the way out to the open sea. And I can still remember seeing newsreels uh, 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 on the news programs, these whales coming up and breathing in those air holes until they made it all the way to safety. It was one of those moments uh, when the world kind of came together to save the whales. There was a cause that drew us together. It kind of felt good. But you know what captured me about all of that? It was those air holes. Because that's what worship is. I come together in a world frozen over by alienation and coldness and harshness and meanness and all those things that just drain my heart, just drain my spirit. You know what I'm talking about. Sometimes I struggle in here on a Sunday morning and I'm just drained. But when I come together in worship, when I sense the movement of God's spirit and I look into your face, it's, it changes. There's that contact that brings life. That's what we talked about four weeks ago. And then after that, we talked about what God does in worship, how He unites all of us. So many different backgrounds and so many different heart languages and worship languages, and yet God brings out this united uh, body of people all on the same track. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And then we talked about, the week after that, we talked about what God expects out of worship. And what God expects out of worship is a lot like, uh, in nature at least, what we expect out of worship. He wants contact. He wants your heart he wants you to be invested. He doesn't want us to move through this like we're just trying to get through this so we can get to the next big thing, right? This is something that we do that uh, is important to us, and it's important to God, and He communicates Himself, and He's looking for those open hearts and those, that, 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 that sense, that spirit that, that welcomes Him in. And then last week, we quit talking about all of that stuff. We set it all aside so we would just worship God. Not that we hadn't been worshiping in those weeks prior to that, but, but we wanted to spend time focusing on the God. Uh, well, we focused on the God who delivers. We looked at several doxologies in the New Testament, and we focused on this God that, that delivers us from the lion's mouth, <laughs> who delivers us from every evil attack. We looked at the God that delivers us and will deliver us safely 
into his heavenly kingdom. And we talked about we praised and we worshipped and we fell down before a God of dominion who alone is the only blessed ruler of the universe. He alone is the one that brings life to everything. He's the one who is King of kings and Lord of lords who dwells in unapproachable light. And then we just thank God. We just thank God over and over again that He's a God of firm security. Because with my life, I need that. Your life, you need that. He is a God who is able to keep us from falling, y'all. He's a God who is able to bring us into His glorious presence without fault. Can you imagine that? Without fault. And in great joy. No wonder every doxology that we looked at ended with the words, To Him be glory and honor and praise and dominion and power and authority forever and ever. Amen. Amen. That's exactly right. Oh, it was, I don't know at what point during that assembly you had the sense that God really had communicated Himself to you. But I, I, I want to tell you, I just had a sense of His presence all the way through that. Now, this, now here's the freaky thing about that. We spent four weeks talking about corporate worship. And, and when you look at the whole broad subject of worship in the New Testament, corporate worship, public worship, occupies, well, that's a subject that occupies the smallest piece of it. He doesn't say very much about that at all. He does make the notion, or, or notates in, in Hebrews chapter 9, that, that the externals are not the emphasis in New Testament worship, and kind of how all of that looks is not really the important thing. The subject of worship is a much broader and much deeper subject than what you and I come here to do on a Sunday morning. And yet, a lot of times, uh, when we think about worship, the only thing that we do think about is what we do on a Sunday morning. And that's not really the whole picture at all. i got a little equation I want you to memorize, even though it's early in the morning. AOL equals W. AOL equals W. All of life is worship. That's really the New Testament message. That really is the New Testament message. Now, the Old Testament, a little different emphasis, a little different picture, but in the New Testament, all of life is worship. And that's too many letters to memorize. How about this? S equals W. Service equals worship because all of life is service. And our service to God, that's what God looks for. Those are the acts of worship that is really, really important to God. And you know what? We are a community that's been called together. If you do much looking into Old New Testament word studies, you know the word ecclesia means the called out who have been called together, right? So we are called together, no doubt about that. But, but here's the, the, the real significance of who we are is not in what we do together, it's when we scatter. Yeah, we're called together to worship, but we're called to scatter in worship at the same time. That's when we are the light of the world. That's when we are the salt of the earth. The world doesn't drive by our building and say, look at them, man, I feel so renewed. They're all inside that building just worshiping and praying and singing. It's just, that's not it. That's not it. It's when we're out there standing in line, waiting on the phone, dealing with rush hour traffic, at work, across the fence with the neighbor. All of that, God says, all of that and even more is worship. And that's what, God's look, that's what God's really looking for in our lives. We come together here to be renewed, and then we scatter to impact the world. Now, we're going to look at a couple of passages. I'm going to get, we're kinda, I'm, I'm going to get doctrinal on you, okay? All right? So we're going to look at a couple of passages here to kind of really get that idea no, uh, fixed in our head. The poster book passage is Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. So take a peek at that just for a moment in your electronic device or on your Bibles, or take a look at your screen. Romans 12 and verse 1. After Paul's been talking about all the uh, God's marvelous doctrine of destiny for you and I, he begins to make some practical applications. This is a passage you and I have looked at already twice in our little series on worship, but we're going to focus on a couple of phrases here. Look at this. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy... Offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Now, that's worship language. That's Old Testament worship language. What they did when they went to the tabernacle or they went to the temple was they made sacrifices, sacrifices to God. So you and I as worshipers now, here's the sacrifice that we make. It's our bodies. It's our living bodies. It's all that we are. Okay? Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. 
Now, your translation that you have in your lap may not say that exactly, that last phrase. It may say, this is your reasonable service. Or it may say something else. There's almost as many translations of that verse as there are translations. And it's because of the word translated as worship up there. It's the word latruo. Okay? And you've heard that before if you've been here for all of our series on worship. There are five words in the New Testament that are called worship words. They're translated as worship. Proskuneo, that's this one, this, this one, to bow in a position or a posture of obedience and to kiss the hand toward, all right? Then there's liturgia, and there's eusebia, there's threskia, and there's lutreo. Lutreo means to serve. And it was a word used in the Old Testament, rich in the Old Testament. It's all over the New Testament as well. Sometimes it's translated as worship. Sometimes it's translated as serve or service. But the idea is it's a word that talks about what the everyday guy did or girl did in worship it was not a word used for the priests it was a word used for folks just like you and me when we would go and worship at the tabernacle or go and worship at the temple latruo it was serving it's what the people did they served here's what worship is it is serving in the offering up of our lives every single day all of life is service all of life is worship that's what we're about. That's what we, that's what we do. That's what God's interested in. That's His focus. Now, you see this word all over the New Testament. We're not going to look at every passage, all right? We don't have enough time to do that. You don't have enough energy to probably stay awake and do all of that. But I want you to think about Acts 24 and verse 14 just for a second. Paul's making his defense in front of the governor Felix. And he says in that passage, he says, I want to tell you what, I have given my life over to worship of God by following the way, the way of Christ discipleship. Worship is discipleship. Back in September when we were talking about discipleship, we were talking about worship, y'all, and didn't even know it. Everything that we do, all of our life, all how we follow God, all of that is worship, he says. Paul even gets more specific in Romans chapter 1 and verse 9. He talks about serving. There it's translated as serve. And he says, I serve my God by preaching the gospel to Gentiles all over the world. In other words, here's what worship is, y'all. It's evangelism. It's when we share our faith. God looks at that. That's a sacrifice of our bodies. That's where we offer up. That's, that's worship. All of that is worship. And maybe, I tell you what, let's do. I, I know you've got it on your, well, no, you just have the address on your screen. I want you to look at another passage here just for a second. This is, this is Hebrews chapter 12. In verse 28, the writer there has been talking about, he's been talking about God and the nature of God and and the judgment of God and the power of God through His Word. And he makes a concluding statement in verse 28. He says, Therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let's be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. How do we worship God? With reverence and with awe. And once again, that word for worship right there is latruo. Let us serve God. How we worship God is through service. It's through the offering up of our lives. It's what we do every day. It's not just that we have reverence and awe in here as we talk about the God of dominion and the God who delivers and the God who is, uh, has firm security, who is able to make a stand, who is able to keep us uh, in joy in His presence. It's not just here. But it's all of our lives. We worship God. Now, what does it look like to worship God in reverence and awe tomorrow morning as you're making your way to work? Well, chapter 13, he gives us, he elaborates on that. Chapter 13 is a chapter change, but it's not a subject change, y'all. And he talks about what worshiping in reverence and awe is all about. So look at verse 1, just for example. How do we worship God? How, do you, how does that happen? As we love one another as brothers. Keep on loving each other, he says, as brothers love each other. Verse 2, entertaining strangers, being hospitable, having our doors open. The word entertainment, the way we normally use it now, doesn't quite capture what he's talking about here. But, but it, you got the idea. You got the idea, having that door open. And then look at verse 3, remembering the folks in prison, uh, taking care of loved ones in prison. That's worship. Look at verse 4, marriage is the way that we serve. Marriage is a matter of worship. Keeping it pure. Holding it up in honor. Wow, who'd have thought it, right? And not only that, look at verse 5. Keeping your lives free from the love of money. 
That's service. That's offering up our lives in service. That's what worship. All of our life is worship. And, and being content with what you have. No matter what's going on around you, no matter how that's looking, how that's falling out, we make that decision to be content. You know why we do that? Because God is a God of dominion. God is a God of deliverance. God is a God of firm security. So we can, being content, making that, it's an attitude. Attitude is worship. He goes on later in the chapter and he talks about some of those things that we normally think of worship, like praise and that sort of thing. He even talks about obeying your leaders, being in submission to elders as an act of, of worship. It's so much more, y'all, than what we do right here. A couple of weeks ago, Rubel Shelley came out with a blog, and he, he quotes a, an evangelist by the name of Luis Palau. I don't know if you've ever heard of Luis or not, but he talks about a metaphor that Luis uses to describe the church. He says, the church is like manure. Any amens here, y'all? Huh? Sometimes you feel like you're knee-deep in it, don't you? Huh? The church is like manure. He says, when you spread it out, it brings life it brings fertility, it makes things green, it bears fruit, but if you just pile it all up and keep it in one place, it just stinks. Yeah, it does. I had a friend of mine that lives in Arkansas. He's a dairy farmer. He's got a big, huge dairy. It's one of the biggest ones in the county, I think. And you could smell that place a long time before you ever got there. The wind was just right. You knew you were coming close to something. He would have to hit a front-end loader where all the cows would come in, you know, to kind of gather, to get milked every day. And he would, he would su shovel. He would just have the big front-end loader for one purpose, and that was to move cow poo over into one big, huge pile. And he, he said, I get piles and piles of it every, every week. I said, well, what, do you, what do you do with that? And he turned around, he pointed to a field. He said, look out there. And you could see all these little spots out in that field that were really green and really verdant and really fruitful. I mean, you could see every little place where he'd been spreading that stuff. And he had several piles there that he hadn't spread. Now, I need to tell you something, one thing, and maybe there's a couple of you out here like me. I really love the way cow poo smells. I grew up on a cattle ranch, and I do. It smells different in the wintertime than it does in the springtime. It's kind of green in the springtime. And there's a smell to that that really is kind of a beautiful thing to me, except when it all gets piled up and sits in the sun. And then it doesn't smell all that good. Louis Palou says, here's what it is. The church is like manure. Spread it out. We are a gathered community. There's no doubt about it. But we are a community that is to be dispersed. That's when the aroma of Christ really comes through. And that's the worship that God is really, really looking for. Yeah, this is necessary. This is a critical piece, what we do in here. But when we're out there, that's when lives are changed. That's when people begin to see uh, the God that you and I know pretty intimately. They begin to see, catch glimpses of Him. Huh? Well, if we just stay up in here all bunched up and we don't get out there, well, we begin to smell, don't we? All kinds of little problems start to, start to pop up. Ann Spangler has written a book called Sitting at the Feet of Rabbi Jesus. And the thesis of that book is, is you got to understand something about Judaism and what uh, the Jewish religion was like in order to appreciate some of the things or a lot of the things that Jesus said and a lot of things that Jesus did. And to research her book, she traveled to Jerusalem several times on El Al Airlines. And I didn't know before this book came out that El Al Airlines is the airlines of choice for a lot of Orthodox Jews. And she said on her first trip over to Jerusalem, uh, three seats in front of her, a Jewish man, a young Jewish man, Orthodox Jew, uh, with his beard and hat and black pants, stands up on the plane and begins to mumble something in Hebrew. And all the while, he's got his arm out, and he's wrapping this black leather strap all the way around his arm over and over, really making it tight. And woven into that strap are little leather pouches. And inside the pouches are little pieces of parchment that have parts of the Old Testament written on it, most of them from Deuteronomy 6. Does anybody what know what Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 6 says? Anybody know? Yes, ma'am, what? Tell it to The word that I'm giving you, to, giving to you today, say it to your children, put it on your doorpost, talk about it on the way to work, talk about it on the way home, and bind it on your hands and your foreheads. So he's literally taking the word and he's binding. It's called the practice of the Tephilim. And the words that he was saying was actually a quote from Hosea chapter 2 where God says to his people, God speaking to his people, says, I betroth you to the Lord, he says. 
I betrothed you in righteousness, and I betrothed you in holiness, and I betrothed you in loving kindness, and I betrothed you in faith that you will belong to the Lord. He's saying all of that. It's a moving kind of thing. Ann said, I sit there, I sat there, and I watched him, and I felt sort of moved. Of course, that's an ancient tradition. They did that sort of thing in Jesus' day. And so, and so she says, there it is. I kind of see this act of piety. And she said, it moved me. And she said, the girl sitting next to me was a young woman said when she wasn't sleeping, and she slept a lot because it's a long flight to Jerusalem. When she wasn't sleeping, she was studying in her prayer book. And the whole time that she would read in her prayer book and she would pray, she was doing this. Have you ever seen on TV Jews at the Wailing Wall? Doing this? Y'all looking at me kind of funny. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, they're doing this. And it's not because they're trying to stay awake. It's called davening. And she found out from a Jewish rabbi that what that represents is that God's Spirit completely fills me, fills my heart, fills my mind, fills my soul, fills the limbs of my body. And the old rabbi said to her, it's like it mimics the movement of the flicker of the flame of a candle. Because after all, according to the old saying, the candle of God is the soul of man. Those acts of piety really kind of come to light, don't they, when you think about the New Testament and Jesus moving through all that. But acts of piety, listen, acts of piety is not the highlight that God calls us to. I mean, that stuff doesn't mean any more, really, than whether you clap or don't clap in a public assembly or, or whether there's instrumentation or not instrumentation in a public assembly. God, that's not the deal. The issue is what really is concerns God is what shows, what goes on in, in your daily life. Is it an act of service? Do you have the notion, do you have the sense that your life is being held up before God? Listen, what do you think of when you hear the word religion? Or you hear the word religious? What do you, is it a good thing or is it a good thing? Okay. Uh, What do you think about religion? Going to church? Uh, Certain observances that a group does, Right? An event that we participate in, religious people participate in that. Religion is praying and singing and worshiping and looking in the Word and all that. Uh, I want you to buckle your seatbelt here. I want you to look at, at the testimony, the witness of the New Testament. James chapter 1. You may want to kind of flip over here to that passage. James chapter 1. I know you're going to see it on your screen, but you might want to underline it because I feel like it's really worth underlining because we've got something really going on here. Here's James. He says, verse 26, If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. It's kind of like a a holy echo. His religion is worthless, worthless, worthless. Deceives, deceives, deceives. Don't let it get past you. Here's what religion looks like. Somebody's got control over their mouth. And if your breath is kind of taken away, you had not buckled your seatbelt yet, go ahead and do that because it gets even more intense. Verse 27, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless. By the way, those are pretty key phrases, aren't they? Religion that God accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Look at this, y'all. Here's, here's, from God's perspective, religion, three things. Keeping your mouth shut. Watching out for the powerless, widows, orphans, social justice kinds of issues, and watching how you live. Keeping your life pure. Keeping your life unspotted. I don't care what the world does. What kind of life are you? There's pure religion. Now, here's the thing about all of that. It's that word religion. And, oh, okay, hang on, we're going to get just doctrinal one more time here. Y'all ready for this? It's the Greek word thraskia. That's one of those five worship words. Thraskia is a word that referred to the externals of religion. When you find it in the Old Testament, in the Greek Old Testament, it was a word used to describe the externals of worship. Like uh, if they're going to sacrifice a lamb, the actual act of sacrificing it would be called thraskia. Or they're going to pour out a drink offering on the altar. That actual act of doing that would be called thraskia. He says, here's the real externals. Here's what the externals are all about. In terms of externals of public worship, as I said a few weeks ago, you could put all those rules in a teacup. There's really one or two. 
It needs to be understandable, and it needs to be orderly. That's basically the sum total of it. Orderly because we're to submit to God and submit to the judgment of the assembly. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 14. The externals are not much, but he says, here's the real externals. Here's the real externals of worship. Watch your mouth. Watch out for those that are powerless. And keep an eye on how you live your life. It matters. There's worship. That's what service. Service is worship. It's kind of like uh, the play, My Fair Lady. Anybody ever seen that? There's a lady in there named Eliza. She's kind of one of the stars. And there's this guy after her in pursuit of her. His name is Freddie. And Freddie's in love with her. He's sick, crazy, knocked down, nutty, goofy, in love with her. And so he writes her a love letter every single day. And he's about to wear her out. And finally she says, words, 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 enough of words. I'm sick of words. If you love me, show me. Don't talk to me about how bright the stars shine at night or how eternal and long-lasting is the nature of love. If you love me, forget the vow. If you love me, show me now. That's not too far a step to get from my fair lady to worship of God, is it? Isn't that what God is saying? This worship is what we... Show. In here? Well, of course that's... In, yeah, but that's not the deal. And I think about all the time that churches have split and fussed and fought and divided with what goes on in here. And you know what? The real issue is what's going on in here. And, and what's going on out there? Out there. God says, here's where worship is. It's service. What are we doing with our life? That's the... That's the that's the message. I mean, that's the majority of the message about worship. And doesn't that fit with what Jesus said to the lady at the well in John chapter 4? Time is coming. Doesn't matter here or there. Doesn't, mm -mm -mm -mm. Externals are not the big issue. The deal is we're going to worship in spirit and in truth. Remember what we said that was? That meant to worship, uh, what, according to God's word and with all your heart? No, not that, not that. But we worship in accordance with the truth that all this stuff, the tabernacle and temple done away, the real tabernacle is in heaven. The real sacrifice died 2,000 years ago and has ascended into heaven. And now worship is all of our lives. He's cleansed our consciences, Hebrews chapter 9. That's what Jesus did that the old law could never do, that no amount of rules could ever do. The blood of Jesus cleansed our consciences. And now he says, with consciences set free, we are free to serve. That word is latruo. We're free to serve or worship God. It is incredible, y'all. It's incredible. Do you know Christianity is a religion of the workplace? It is not a religion of the cathedral. It is not a religion of facility and all the money we spend on that stuff. And I'm not opposed to that. You understand? I mean, an environment in here can be very conducive to our hearing God, to our worship to our participation as participants. I'm not opposed to that stuff. I mean, even that we're here instead of in a tent somewhere under a bush. Oh, that's cool that we have air conditioning and seats and all of that stuff and all the other little aesthetic things that help us have the sense that we're drawn into the presence of God. All, I'm not opposed to that. But you understand, Christianity is a religion of the marketplace. You know how many times, you know how many public appearances Jesus made in the New Testament? Anybody know? Anybody want to know why you'd want to know that? I don't know. But sometimes statistics can be a little bit telling. And the London Institute of Contemporary Christianity did some calculation. Let me share this with you. They say that Jesus made 142 public appearances in the New Testament. 142. 132 of them were in the marketplace. Only 10 were in church or synagogue. Does that say anything? What kind of blares at me, particularly in light of this whole Frescia Lutreo business? That's sort of... That's sort of do, you have a, do, you, do you know how many parables Jesus told? Anybody know? You know what? It depends on... It really depends on uh, how you define parable because there's different counts. According to the London Institute of Contemporary Christianity, there were 52 parables. 45 of them dealt with the marketplace. 45 of the 52. And by the way... Who were the guys that Jesus picked to build his church? How many of them were preacher types? Can y'all see that? How many of them were priests? How many of them were rabbis? All 12 of them were men associated with the workplace. It's a marketplace religion, y'all. Now, look, there's two things I want you to take home here. I'm going to do this really quickly. 
Time just sort of got away from me. I get all doctrinal, I get crazy, I forget the clock. So here you are. Real quick, two things. One is, if you're, I want you to be in, if service is worship, be involved in a public ministry of this congregation. You, at least one. At least one. You may be more talented than that, but you know what? We've got a lot of folks that are not involved in any ministry here at Sugar Grove. It's almost as if the whole of Christianity is coming here on Sunday and what are we doing here? I'm going to tell you, that's important. Don't let that go. If you declutter your life, don't let public worship go. Don't let life groups go. Don't let uh, financial generosity go. Don't let serving go. Ephesians chapter 4 says that we come together. God's gifted us so that we fit together. Find a ministry. And you know what? I, I, listen, you, if you don't know what your gift is, don't worry about that. You can take a gift assessment test. But really, uh, let me tell you the best test is when you start to do something, does it give you a buzz? That's the best way of knowing if you're in an area of you're gifted or not. Does it give you a buzz? Do you feel energized or do you just feel drained? And you can feel drained, you can feel tired doing something you really love, but it feels different. It's a good kind of tired. You know what I mean? So do, what, what really gives you a, a, a buzz? What really, what really gives you a, a sense of energy? Because you're unique. You're absolutely unique. Whales are unique and cactus is unique. But you can't expect a whale to thrive in the desert or a cactus to thrive at the bottom of the ocean. Get into an area that you feel, that, 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 that you have that sense that God has called you to. Everybody get involved in ministry. Here's the second thing I want you to do. Get involved in something that really stretches you. Something that's really personal with other people. Hmm, maybe it's a hand of Christ ministry and you're mentoring homeless teens or maybe it's something you kind of got boiling in the back of your brain that you want to be whatever it is find that get involved in it next week I'm going to give you some ideas about some stuff and we're going to hear from some folks in the congregation here who are doing some really really neat kinds of ministry serving sorts of things because life is worship service is worship I'll close with a little letter this letter, I didn't really know about it. I knew about the event several years ago, but I didn't come across this letter until a few weeks ago. Well, it had been in my files for a while, and I'd forgotten about it. It's written by a little girl named Karen Watson. She's a little Baptist girl. The letter is dated March the 7th, 2003. And on March the 15th, 2004, Karen and four other missionaries were killed. She was a missionary to the Middle East. And in the letter, she's writing back to her ministers that are here in the States. And she says... You should only be opening this letter in the event of my death. Then she says, when God calls, there's no regrets. I tried to share my heart with you as much as possible, my heart for the nations. I wasn't called to a place. I was called to Him. To obey was my objective. To suffer was expected. His glory, my reward. Yes, His glory, my reward. That sounds like worship language to me, does it to you? That's worship. And it's all about her service. She goes on to talk about the ministry that she had, some details. But then she talks about her funeral service. She says, in regards to any service, keep it small and simple. Yes, simply just preach the gospel. Be bold and preach the life-saving, life-changing, forever eternal gospel. Give glory and honor to our Father. Worship stuff. She says, care more than some think is wise. Risk more than some think is safe. Dream more than some think is practical. Expect more than some think is possible. And here's how she closes. I was called not to comfort or success, but to obedience. There is no joy outside of knowing Jesus and serving Him. I love you too, and I love my church family in His care, Karen. Words of service, words of life, words of worship. Can we serve you in any way? We want to do that as we stand and sing. In my life, Lord, be glorified. Be glorified. In my life, Lord, in my life.